the Living Shadow by Rennie Morris The night had spread her velvet cloak across the heavens, a thousand stars like uncountable watching eyes shone down upon the sleeping earth. A small cloud drifted over the face of the moon, creating a brief darkness, and then once more the moon's light cast eerie shadows over the sleeping fields, throwing into relief the nocturnal outlines of paths and hedges. It was a perfect night, a night for the living, yet for one man this would be the last he would breathe, Fate, which, like a croupier, gathers in his winnings unsatisfied with earlier victories, had ordained this. How unexpected is the last ace in the pack? Manson's card was this night to be turned. He bid a fond good night to the dark-eyed girl, and with happy heart he started to walk home. The night was fair and his lodging only a short distance away. Soon he left the busy road, and turned his step to follow his usual route home across the fields. As he strode along the tree-shrouded lane, he was happily unaware that he had provoked the hate of a man. Indeed, he would have been bewildered, for, living a simple life of goodness, he had never wittingly interfered with another's. The mind of a man in love ceases to act in a logical fashion. One man's jealousy had grown out of all reasonable proportion, and had filled his soul with hate. A hate so intense that it obliterated reason and was replaced by one desire, Manson's death. Now the time had come for this desire to be fulfilled. Rutland was a young man, tall and lean-faced, he was animal-like in his emotions, which were aroused savagely and instantly if fate went against him. He and the devil were kinsmen this night, crouched well hidden in the bushes at the side of the stile over which Manson would come for the last time. He waited, talked as an animal watches for his prey, hungry for the kill. Only the slight shaking of his large hands and an uncontrolled twitching of the muscles of his face betrayed any emotion. His senses were unnaturally tuned to every sound and vibration. The eyes that watched were alive and bright. This was it. Soon Manson would trouble him no more. The waiting would be over, and the job accomplished. Overhead the stars pinpointed the vastness, the eyes of the heavens watching him. Somewhere along the darkened lane, somebody was whistling. Rutland's body tensed. For a moment, silence. Then, still far down the lane, footsteps. The clicking of a walking stick accompanied the hollow footfalls. It was him. Rutland's heart beat faster, and the knuckles of his right hand whitened. In it, shining like a long, wet tooth was a knife. In a surprisingly short space of time, the figure of a man came into view. As he climbed the stile, his shadow, long and black, fell almost at Rutland's feet. The shadow paused. Fumbling in his outer pocket for a moment, he pulled out his pipe and filled it carefully. A small flame lit the face up for an instant affording enough assurance to Rutland that this was the man he was after. Leaning back against the stile, the man pulled on his pipe and gazed up at the stars. The smoke curled up, a faint aroma of tobacco filling the night air. Rutland smirked cynically in the darkness. Smoke on, my friend, for this will be your last chance, he thought. Even a legally condemned man is granted a last smirk. He felt calmer now, Manson's small form leaning there, so content and unsuspecting. It was almost amusing. 
this would be easy. Unhooking his stick, Manson was about to walk on when a movement in front of him caused him to stop. A man, suddenly and without notice, mysteriously appeared before him and stood, facing him. He was surprised to see anyone at this time of night, but it was the way the man was standing there that was so unnerving. Like a great ape, legs slightly apart, long arms dangling at his sides, he stood. His face was not visible, but Manson could discern a row of white teeth in the darkness. His blood ran cold inside him but he tried not to show fear to this man. His voice came clearly and with great calmness, as, taking a few steps towards the figure, he asked, Who are you? What do you mean by trying to frighten the life out of me? Though he could not see the face, Manson felt surrounded by hate. He thought he recognized the voice, but was not sure. You may well ask that, my friend. I am going to claim your soul this night, and give it to the devil. <laughs> there was a ghostly chuckle. <laughs> May I ask what I have done to provoke you to such an act? The teeth disappeared from the dark mask. <laughs> you take the only girl I ever loved, and then stand there and ask that? The voice grated harshly. Manson decided the fellow must be mad, and resolved to try to humour him. It was unlikely that anyone would pass this way at this hour, but he might get a chance to run for it. It was plain now that the threat on his life was a real one. He must therefore convince this fellow that he was making a mistake, but even the conviction of his own innocence did not reassure him. I don't know you. As for taking your girl, I'm not even courting, so you must have the wrong person. Don't lie to me. Lying won't save you. You saw her tonight. Who? Lorraine Peters. Oh, so that was it. Manson had only asked the girl her name this very night. It came as a shock to him that she could be the cause of all this trouble. He tried to laugh. Why, I hardly know her. I only learned her name tonight. I'm not even sure she likes me. She does. I've heard talk about you and her. But she were not having her. I shall see to that. Manson was struggling to think. The situation was becoming complicated. You have it all wrong. She doesn't want me. A tall man took a step nearer. Don't be a fool. You'll know what I say is true when you see her again. I... His voice trailed away as he saw the tall man's big hands caressing the big knife. Suddenly the two of them came together as if drawn by an invisible wire. The knife hovered above Manson's head. Instinctively he swung his walking stick with all his strength, and the knife dropped to the ground. It sank into the grass at Manson's feet. The impact as the stick whipped the long arm had sent it twisting out of his hand. Taking advantage of the bigger man's momentary inability to act, Manson gripped the arm and sent his assailant hurtling over his shoulder. Before he could regain his feet, Manson tried to make a run for it. He had only run a few yards when a large hand grasped his shoulder and swung him to the ground. Rutland's two strong hands were on his throat. With a superhuman effort, Manson threw him off. Over and over they rolled, panting and straining. The blow from the stick had only succeeded in maddening Rutland, giving him the strength of three men. Manson knew that he was slowly losing. Now he was struggling to free himself rather than fight. Sweat rolled down his face. It blurred his vision and he became frantic. The other's strength was terrific, and try as he might, he would not be able to hold those searching fingers away from his throat much longer. They twisted and stretched, gripping ever tighter. If they got a proper grip, he was finished. He knew that he would not stand a chance. Tremors of cramp twitched in his arms. In a desperate effort to free himself, he managed to bring his knee up and caught the other a sharp jab in the groin. The big man lost his grip and Manson rolled free. 
He was almost on his feet when he felt a sharp tug at his leg, and down he went yet again. He had a fleeting glimpse of his stick, which curled round his leg like a long brown snake. He must have hit his head when he fell, because everything went black for a brief second. When he looked up, he saw Rutland standing astride him. There was a swishing in the air above his face. He heard himself scream thinly. His face seemed to split, and it burned horribly. Again it crashed down, and Manson's senses reeled in waves of acute pain. He struggled feebly, but could not move himself. His sight seemed to come and go in waves of agony. He saw the big man's face above him for a moment. Then his senses dulled. It had disappeared the next time he could see. And lying there, he fancied that he could see the stars, but he was not sure. He was not sure of anything any more. Everything looked distorted and unreal. Far away, a voice spoke. It began as a whisper, and as his senses slowly returned, it grew in volume. At last, your time on this earth has come to an end, Manson. Manson sighed it fully returned. What he saw made him shudder with all his being and wish that he could return to the opiate of oblivion. He made an effort to move, but failed. He tried to speak, but the words stuck in his throat. This was to be his end. He was not afraid to die, but with all of him he desired revenge. The word repeated itself over and over again in his tormented mind. In that very moment he knew that his desire would be fulfilled. The numbness overcame him, and he could feel himself floating. All pain had now gone, and he had a feeling of great well-being. Rutland stood over him. In his hands he held a huge stone. He lifted it a few inches and let go. The heavy stone thudded dully covering Manson's head. The thing was done. Manson was dead. Rutland stood there, his shoulders bent and the big hands hanging, inert now at his sides. He stared down at the body in the grass and shivered. As he gazed dispassionately at the body, so lifeless and still, something snapped inside him. He felt tired and weak, all anger spent. The night had suddenly turned cold, or was it the coldness of fear that had crept into his heart? For he felt fear as he had never known before. He feared for his own life now. He roused himself with a jerk. He must find a hiding place for the body, which would go unnoticed until the mangled thing at his feet had rotted away, leaving no trace. Quickly he glanced around. The land was flat for at least two hundred yards all round, except for the shrub that grew on a piece of rough ground by the stile. It would afford him a little cover until he could find a better place for it. It was unlikely that anyone would pass this way now. It was almost midnight. He reached down and with an effort moved the heavy boulder that covered half the head. The sight that confronted him turned his stomach over. The skull hung open at the forehead. Grey, slimy substance oozed out, released by the removal of the weight. A thin line of blood trickled down the ashen face, and the eyes stared sightlessly up at him. Although he could not bring himself to look down again, he knew that what he had seen was reality not delusion. The face was smiling, a horribly inhuman smile in death, and Rutland stumbled away from it and leant weakly against the stile. He peered into the darkness of the lane, where all was still. He turned back to the body in the grass, and could not avoid seeing the face still grinning up at him. He suddenly felt panic and with an effort suppressed a desire to run, turning his back on it to blot out the gory sight. 
He took hold of each leg to drag the lifeless thing into the shrubbery. It was heavy and unmanageable. He could feel the arms dragging and catching in the stubby undergrowth as if they were fighting to fasten onto something solid. He dropped the legs with a thud and looked about him for a likely spot. At the bottom of the bank he saw a ditch. A close inspection proved it to be the ideal hiding place, for the grass grew high and it was overhung by the hedge that bordered the furthermost side. This discovery gave him some relief. Feeling better able to master his task, he returned to the body and once more took up the legs. Having dragged it down the bank, he pulled the trailing arms into position and rolled it into the ditch. Somehow the shoulders had lodged, and the luminous, smiling face floated in the shadows like the face of a devil. The eyes shone, as with lifelike gaze they fastened upon him. He had to cover them. Swiftly he gathered twigs and heavy foliage, placing them without ceremony over the mangled corpse. It was done. He passed a shaking hand over his forehead and realised that he was sweating. He turned away up the slope with quick steps, his feet sinking a little in the wet grass, slowing his movements. At the top of the bank he turned round to take a last look at the ditch. There was nothing to be seen of his gruesome work. Breathing a sigh of relief, he made his way out of the shrubbery, avoiding all obstacles carefully. He must leave no traces. In the tree-covered lane, he had an uncanny feeling that he was being followed. The branches overhead blotted out the starry sky, and in this darkened tunnel he was afraid. A twig snapped, close at hand. He shot a nervous glance over his shoulder, half expecting to see the figure of Manson behind him. But he saw nothing, yet could not convince himself that he was alone. Click, click, click of a walking stick fell in with his footstep. The darkness shrieked with the sound. The faster he went, the faster they fell. Oh God! He had forgotten the walking stick. Where was it? He stopped. Better go back and look for it. Someone might find it. The impenetrable sheet of blackness faced him. He shuddered at the thought of going back along the lane, so full of strange movements and whisperings. A deep sense of foreboding had planted a doubt in his mind. He would go back. He could not go back. Anything was preferable. He would go back and look in the daylight when he felt calmer. He moved more quickly now, and he breathed a sigh of relief when he emerged at the end of the lane. Now that he was in the open, he came once more into the silvery light. The air was cooler now, smelling sweet and fresh. He became calmer and thought about the girl for whom he had risked his neck tonight. Was it going to be worth it? He would treat her with such love and devotion that she would not be able to help loving him. He knew that he had once inspired great love in her, and would do so again. There was no one to stop him now. Lorraine lay sleeping. The lines that were fast appearing showed clearly on his face as he watched his wife. She stirred. Well? Her hand moved across the bed to find it empty. I'm here, darling, he said. Oh, I thought you were wandering again. Mel, did you sleep well last night? Of course I did, he said, a little irritably. All right, so I didn't sleep. I went down and got myself a drink. There's nothing wrong in that, is there? She slid out of bed and went across to where he stood by the window. He did not look at her when she laid a gentle hand on his arm. I'm sorry, Mel. It's just that I worry about you. You are not well lately. Why don't you see a doctor? He would give you something to make you sleep. I'm all right, 
he said, as his expression softened, and he patted the small hand. I'm fine. Fine. Lorraine knew that there was something on his mind that he kept from her. They had been married three months now, and still he would not tell her what was troubling him. Towards night he started to act strangely, and seemed to grow afraid. At night she would hear him moving about, for he seldom slept. When he did, he tossed and turned, waking in a sweat. Always he insisted on drawing the curtains before it was really necessary. She knew that there was something, but despite all these clues, she could not even guess what it was. The thought had struck her that he could be going out of his mind. He had changed so much from their earlier gaiety that sometimes Lorraine was afraid of him. If only he would see a doctor. Rutland's dream was always the same. He would see eyes. He would make frantic clutches at the bedclothes as he tried to shield himself from them. He felt impelled to get out in the mornings, and this became a habit for an hour or two before breakfast. He loved the daylight, and he would come back in a much happier frame of mind, as if he had forgotten the fear that haunted his nights. I'm going out, Laurie. I won't be long. He heard her acknowledgement from up the stairs, and remembered his empty promises to her to see a doctor. The warm sunshine did much to dispel the memories of a night he had spent in a cold sweat. The watching eyes had gone, and he could look up at the sky without fear. It was hard to imagine indeed at this magic moment that the horrors of the night even existed, those nights that held such indescribable terrors. He felt almost sane again, but he knew that something was going to happen. He could feel it approaching. What was it, this thing of which he was so afraid? Manson was dead, and yet in the darkness he could feel his presence. In the daylight he felt safe and unafraid, but each night the feeling grew more intense. Suddenly he felt he must know. He could not go on like this and steadily go out of his mind. The only thing to do was to go and see for himself, and exorcise those nightly ghosts. The papers had reported Manson as missing, but as far as he knew the body was still undiscovered. What if Manson was not dead? No, impossible. A mental picture of him lying dead on the grass reassured Rutland that he must be dead. After all, if he were alive, what had become of him? Where was he? God, where was he? He told himself that he was not afraid to go. No, the very thought was enough to turn his stomach. He turned his step towards the open fields, involuntarily quickening his pace. He almost felt as if he were being drawn by some power outside of himself, an indwelling force that urged him on. Good morning, Rutland! He swung round, startled. It was an acquaintance from his club. Mind if I tag along? Early constitutional and all that. Going far? Blast the man. Of all the people he knew, it would have to be this one. No hope of shaking him off now, without arousing suspicion, anyway. This man liked the sound of his own voice and would probably go on talking for hours. It would be certainly unwise to appear rude. He tried to sound at ease when he spoke, and was surprised at how well he managed it. Not far. Just along by the farm and back. Good, his companion beamed. We never see you at the club now that you are married. Fellows have been asking about you. How about coming up one night? Oh, with the little woman, of course. Oh, we don't go out much at night. Rutland replied, with as much civility as he could muster. Gathered that, his companion replied, with a chuckle. Just married and all that. The nudge and knowing leer that accompanied this remark sickened Rutland almost as much as the thoughts which were still coursing through his brain. 
On and on he went, the drone of his voice becoming monotonous. They walked for ten minutes. Ten long minutes. The man suddenly stopped. Hi there, he called. A feminine voice answered. Through a break in the hedge, he could see a young woman walking towards them across the fields. A smile spread over the face of Rutland's companion. I say, old man, mind if I leave you? I was hoping to see this girl. This was a lucky break, and he almost managed to smile as he answered. Not at all. It was nice to have seen you. He left the two of them together, and shortly afterwards turned into that all-too-remembered lane. The trees overhead blotted out the sunlight, and he felt suddenly chilled. This was the lane that had haunted his dreams. It was wide for a lane, and he could see a long way down it. The hedges on both sides were high and impregnable, and the tree trunks were not visible. Above his head twined a dome of thick foliage. He felt shut in and his heart beat a little faster as he heard the sound of his own footsteps. As he neared the stile, his heart thudded. What would it look like after four months? The thought of seeing an emaciated body brought him out in a cold sweat, and the knowledge that it had only been there for that short space of time did nothing to allay his fears. He felt compelled to go on. Something drew him along in spite of what he might find. He crossed the stile and stood for a while, scrutinising the open countryside. He saw no one. With shaking fingers, he lit a cigarette and pulled on it for a while to steady his nerves. Then, making up his mind, he stepped into the scrubby growth and walked a few paces. It looked unfamiliar in the broad light of day, and he stopped to think. The ground was dotted with small shrubs, but rose a little farther on where the bushes grew larger and thicker. It all came flooding back to him. The bank must be the rise in front of him. It must be. He didn't drag Manson very far, that much he did remember. Slowly he mounted the rise and looked down upon the thin line of the ditch. He was suddenly terrified. Uncannily he felt Manson's presence. Everywhere. The very air breathed of him. Why be afraid of it? It could not harm now. Even as he thought these things, the sweat started out on his forehead and the palms of his big hands grew damp. He half expected to see Manson rise up out of his hiding place and stand grinning at him. He forced himself to go on. The thought that he might sleep the sounder for knowing that Manson still lay where he had been left set him off down the bank. He reached the bottom and stood at the edge of the ditch. The pile of sticks denoted the place. Manson lay dead under there. He felt sick. His very being screamed at him to turn and run, to flee from this place and never look back. Yet he knew that he must look, for his nerves could not stand another night of doubt. Slowly, with a pounding heart, his hand went out to pull the sticks gently away to one side of the ditch. He stood for a moment with eyes closed. Then, with an effort, he forced himself to look into the ditch. What he saw almost caused his heart to stop. Smiling up at him, with black, seething eyes, lay Manson. The forehead yawned open, and inside, black and shining, bubbling in their hundreds, swarmed countless ants. The glassy eyes had gone. In their sockets, ants rose and fell in black, struggling masses. The mouth eternally smiled, yet behind the ivory of the teeth, was a further moving mass. The face was white, the starkest white Rutland had ever seen. God, those ants! 
The head was dense with them. He stumbled away and sank down on the soft grass. It was horrible to think about, and yet it would be imprinted on his mind for the rest of his life. He sat staring into space, revolted, nauseated. What on earth had induced him to return to this place to uncover a sight worse than all the imaginings of hell's horrors? He felt a movement in the grass near his hand. Peering down, he recoiled as swiftly as lightning. A long line of ants was swarming across the grass and over his shoes, and he saw with horror that they were coming from the pile of sticks in the ditch. Their swollen black bodies gleamed in the sunlight as they came over the edge. Rutland was transfixed, rooted to the spot. Faster and faster they came. He looked all round but found only the black line, now wider, leading back to the ditch. With the slow dawning of terror, he realised that the ants were emerging from Manson's head. Manson's presence permeated the air about him, growing stronger as he stared stupefied at the line of ants blackening the grass as they bubbled towards him. He leapt back, frantically shaking them from his shoes as he turned and ran, stumbling and falling up the bank. He paused briefly to glance over his shoulder. The ants had not followed him. They seemed to be collecting and were covering the grass in a huge writhing mass. Fascinated, he watched. They seemed to be taking shape. They moved over the grass a little, and the main body of ants divided down the middle. Again they divided, fashioning a form of some kind. It was uncanny. He would wake and find he had been dreaming. What he saw next shocked him into reality. The figure of Manson lay on the grass below. <laughs> Lorraine found him oh. crying like a child, <laughs> unable to tell her what was wrong. <laughs> Once she had persuaded him to go to bed, she went for the doctor. First, locking him in his room. What she had feared for some time had happened. She now was desperate to find out the cause of this outbreak, which had been boiling for so long. The officer from the mental hospital arrived that evening. I'm so glad you've come, Mr. Leonard. Something terrible has happened to Mel. Did you follow him this morning? In order to safeguard Rutland, she had had him watched for the past week. Mr. Leonard gently closed the door. Have you locked him in his room? She nodded. You must come to the police station with me, my dear, as I'm afraid there is something you must know. She knew then that there was no hope for Mel. The journey was endless, but eventually the car stopped with a jolt and she allowed herself to be led through to an inner room in the police station. Having drunk a cup of tea with shaking hands, she was asked a few questions. The words drummed against her skull. Why was she there? What had the police got to do with a case of mental illness? She was told as gently as possible that Rutland had been found by Mr. Leonard that morning in a state of nervous hysteria. When approached, Rutland ran like a madman across the fields. Mr. Leonard decided the ditch held the answer to the man's strange behaviour, and went and inspected it. He found the body of Manson. Wasting no time, he rang the police and told them. Apparently, Mel had made his way home by roundabout route, reaching home without being seen by anyone. Some time after, he was taken to the mental hospital, where it was to be decided whether he was fit enough to stand trial. His fingerprints were the same as those found on the walking stick, which had been taken in as lost property. Manson's name was inside the crook. Not much notice had been taken at the time, but now the name had come to light and was connected with the missing man, so Rutland found himself in a locked room. And as the darkness slowly descended, he was faced with an even greater horror. Night. He ate nothing. Through the high window he could see the stars, those perpetually watching eyes. 
He shielded his eyes from them, and his ravings grew wilder. Let me out, he called. Let me out, or I shall die. The orderly outside grinned to himself. Poor mad fella, he thought. An hour went by, and faint moonlight filtered through the small window. He was quiet now, utterly spent. His head had dropped to his shoulder, and he slept fitfully. He was dreaming that he was back by the ditch, watching those ants. God, those ants. He came to. He could feel Manson's presence coming ever nearer. Running to the door, he cried out in a voice of tormented agony. Let me out! Oh, God, let me out! An orderly came along the corridor and tapped on the door. It's all right, old chap. You're quite safe here. Get into bed and go to sleep. With that, he was gone. Rutland shouted after him, but to no avail. You don't understand. He will get me, he moaned. The night crept on with sounds and whisperings. He slid round the walls of his room, half crazy with fear. He dared not look up, for then he would see the window, and through it, the stars. A shaft of moonlight slid in, fingering the darkness. He avoided it, as though it might do him some harm, but the light it gave was comforting in the blackness he dreaded so much, and he stood back to watch it. His mind wandered back again to the ants, and he whimpered like a child. Down the corridor, two night orderly officers were talking together. Suddenly one looked up. Did you see something then, Bill? His companion looked about him in the dim light. He shook his head. No. Why? I thought I saw a shadow pass by. His friend laughed. I'd like to see anyone get inside this place at night. He imagined it. They stood listening for a while, but heard nothing. They continued their conversation in a low tone. Along the wall, the black shadow of a man moved on up the corridor. It stopped outside Rutland's door. It seemed to fall to the floor. Then it moved on. The head slid under the door until it had completely disappeared beneath it. Rutland had the intense feeling that he was not alone. An ever-abiding presence shadowed him. His face twitched and his eyes darted round the walls and tried to pierce the blackness. The moonlight fell again on the wall. In its pale light, Rutland saw the black figure moved towards him. No! 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 He screamed with all the pent-up force of his lungs. Get away from me! <sighs> the shadow drew nearer. Taking a blanket from his bed, he tried to beat the thing, to separate it and stamp it out but he found that nothing he did was any use. He seemed to be fighting thin air. He hauled himself up on the bed and screamed again. He could feel hundreds of pinpricks creeping inexorably up his body. They reached his face, and he opened his mouth to scream yet again. But it was blocked and filled by the seething, writhing swarm. It was not long before he fell to the floor, coated with ants from head to foot. And after some time, the ghostly moaning ceased. The morning sun shone warmly and the hospital staff were engaged in their daily tasks. 
The orderly opened Rutland's door. The food he carried dropped to the floor with a clatter. Oh, come quickly! Quickly! He babbled, almost incoherently. Footsteps sounded along the corridor. The doorway filled with white-aproned staff, in gruesome contrast with the black mass on the floor. The excited jabber brought the matron in charge. It's a skeleton matron, covered with dead ants. Somewhere, Manson smiled on. Today's story was The Living Shadow by Rennie Morris. It was read by Jasper Lestrange. As ever, I hope you enjoyed it, and until next time, sweet dreams. <laughs>